Uh, um, so how much is that? So all right, welcome. We are the podcast editor's mastermind, and we're getting started actually a little bit early again. That's twice in a row now that we've done that. Not sure what's happening. But anyway, tonight I'm going to be in the hot seat, and I'm not at all nervous about that, and we haven't talked about it backstage or anything, but we'll be talking about that. The hope here is that you'll pick something up for your business as well as we talk through some of the challenges that I'm facing. Joining me on this side is... Jennifer Longworth with Bourbon Barrel Podcasting, and you didn't say who you were, by the way. Oh, okay. I'm Brian. You can find me at toptieraudio.com, which you may or may not want to do after this call. We'll see. And then we have actually... <laughs> Three special guests. All of them are from Tansy Astra Academy, and you might recognize Tara and also Jesse. They've both been on the show. And then we've also got Amanda joining us on the side where my arm is sticking off the camera. So welcome to the three of you. So I'm the newbie here is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you're the newbie, but that's okay because we're kind and gentle or something like that. Anyway, on the last episode of the Podcast Editor's Mastermind, we were talking about some of the things that are going on in our business. And I shared that I'd faced some recent business challenges through the course of last year. Business had declined for a number of reasons that had to do with people stopping production, all that kind of stuff. And we said, hey, maybe on the next episode, we'll put Brian in the hot seat. I said, uh, okay. And then the next day, Jesse reached out and said, hey, this is the kind of stuff that we do at Tansy Astor Academy. Would you mind if we came on the show and talk to you about it? So that's what we've done. With that, I'm going to try and get out of the way and let the three of them make this into something useful. So I'm going to pass it on to you. So you were talking about just problems you were you were trying to plan for 2024. Yeah. You said you were looking at pricing, marketing, and I think there were a couple other things we'll get to. So, Tara, actually, Amanda, you and I can start with the pricing stuff. The first thing I want to say, though, Brian, is you are not the only person who is dealing with this at all. This is very common what you're talking about. People who've been in business for decades run into the same issues you're talking about. So it's not a it's not a Brian specific issue that's going on. But pricing, I, I feel like pricing is always the really tricky part because you want to be competitive, but you want to make sure that you can get the clients and you have to make sure you're not working twice as hard for the same amount as other people. And it's, there's no right answer. You can't just Google what should my prices be and then you're good to go. So a lot of it, I think just, it comes into getting to know your clients, really talking to people, trying to find those people who will be honest about what they can afford to pay, what they see value in, how you can differentiate yourself from others but it takes time to build those relationships. I think sometimes people get in the, I need sales. I need a client right now. They're offering half of what I know that I'm worth, but I need the work right now. So I'm going to take it. And that just kind of gets you in a trap. But usually if you're able to talk to somebody and get to understand, well, I offer the, these same services as other people, but I offer them in a different way that might serve you better. But the communication has to be there. You have to get them first, which is where Tara and the marketing probably comes in. But <laughs> And then AI is changing all of this too. And so many of us have like package pricing. And I think we need to start shifting away from thinking of packages as in the what that we do and more in the how. Start looking at offering levels of service where we focus more on giving premium service to those who pay the premium, having a standard service where it's a lot more, we're using AI wherever we can to have a more efficient workflow. Because whether we like it or not, trying to sell people on the importance of quality is difficult enough now. Wait another year, two, three years down the road. It's going to be almost impossible to try to tell people why they need to be hiring us to do all of this manual, high-quality work when they can't hear the difference. So there's a lot of things kind of in flux right now in the podcast editing space. And it's just kind of a matter of figuring out what value can we offer to clients that can't be replaced by AI. If we really look at it, production work is at the bottom rung of the overall ladder. If we want to 
do better with making income, we need to find ways to move higher up that ladder so that we're not focused primarily on the production. I mean, this has been kind of the underpinning of conversations over the last year, right? And it feels a little bit like, yeah, I know that, but also I don't really know how to think about some of this yet. There are certain parts of my workflow that do in- include some AI tools. I think I probably use some of the same tools that Jesse does, which help with some parts of this. But there's still, in everything that I do, there's a, a human element. I, I was actually having a client call yesterday, and they were talking about using Descript. And I, because I've used Descript before, I was able to ask a couple of questions about some shortcomings of that software and highlight how I can do that better. But at the same time, like I can't see myself ever offering what I would call a, a Descript only service. And I hate to pick on that software, but you know, the automated um removals and whatever it didn't properly transcribe is assumed to be silence. And so you're m- missing stuff here and there. Like I can't see that ever being something that I would offer. And so I'm a little bit uncertain to think about how I would think about different levels of service and differentiation as it relates to pricing. One of the ways is to look at the different services you offer and figure out what stuff can we use more AI heavy? What stuff, I mean, we know tools are going to keep getting better. Right now, the editing itself is the one thing that's going to be difficult to move to strictly AI. But as more clients are looking for people who can offer everything, show notes, whatever the services are, are there things we can use AI to be able to offer those without adding significantly to the price so we can still compete without making everything, focusing on AI everything. So we use like AI for show notes and descriptions, titles, stuff like that, not really adding a whole lot to the cost so we can focus on the manual work we need to do. So is that kind of streamlining your internal processes so you're spending less time doing the work so you don't have to charge quite so much? Because if you can get into that flow where, okay, I can use these AI tools, it cuts a lot of the manual time, then you're not feeling as crunched. Well, I have this show and now I have to spend all of this time doing this and then I have to do these show notes and I have to do all of this stuff. And then it becomes more time intense per each client. Is it kind of using those processes to reduce the amount of time you have to spend on the same thing so you don't feel like you have to keep charging more to balance your time? Because it's kind of a time management thing too, right? Like you're one person, you can only take on, you only have so many hours and it's being able to allocate those hours in a way that helps you a little bit more. And sometimes it's not even tools related to editing. There's the whole backend process, client interaction, if there's ways we can streamline the back end of the business, that helps us as well. If, if I can ask, what are the, some of the things that you've been able to streamline from the back end? Because I like to think mine is pretty streamlined, but hey, I only know my business. We're in the middle of transitioning over to HoneyBook, where we can basically automate the entire process from oh, wow. the time they go to our website, they click a link, they can book a call. We can gather information from them, give then say have a discovery call with them, provide them a quote with different packages. They can choose the package. Once they choose that, they get invoiced, then they get their the client agreement. We can automate the onboarding process. So that's one of the things we're working on right now, as opposed to having our contracts and panda doc and trying to bring everything into one place where we can automate as much of that process as possible. Okay. Yeah. I guess I was thinking more in terms of like the ongoing client interactions, like file delivery, that kind of stuff. But that's a, that's a good, another good take on it. They have these fun portals where you can upload files and communicate that way okay. to HoneyBook. And you can actually link it to your Gmail account. If you have, like, or if you have like Google workspace for your email, you can connect that. So you can sync your calendars and all of that fun stuff. That's HoneyBook as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. I guess I need to go check them out again. It does come as, as an expense. You know, we always try to keep your overhead low, mm-hmm. but it's that whole time time versus money. I mean, both have the, the value, but 
it's if you're able to maybe you spend the and I don't actually know what HoneyBook costs, but you spend a little bit per month, and but you don't have to put as much time and energy into all that back end stuff. Now you have more hours available that you can do the marketing things that you don't really want to do, but you know you need to, or maybe that's the time that you get to spend with your personal things that you want to do. But it's sometimes that extra cost is going to be minimal when you compare it to the amount of time you save. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. I was actually looking through my books earlier, and uh, one of the things that I discovered was one of the most significant expenses I had last year, which wasn't a huge surprise, was subcontractors, because I had some people working on some shows for me. And because the business has kind of declined, I've had to stop doing that, as you would expect, right? You have to preserve the margin. And so maybe there are some ways that this kind of automation could reduce the need for that. I don't know that I would ever get back two hours per episode, but maybe there's enough there. Why do you think your business declined this year? Because I'm hearing it a lot across the board and it seems like it's for similar reasons. A combination of client life changes and different directions. So there was, I didn't have any clients that said, I'm leaving you for another editor. But what I did have was three shows that were through a production company and that company stopped operations. So I lost those shows because they're not making them anymore. And then I had two others where the hosts just stopped producing the show. You know, they just said, hey, I'm done. It wasn't a whole lot of I'm losing them to Jennifer or to Daniel or to Jesse. It was a lot of we're stopping the show. We won't need you anymore because we're not going to pay you to not produce a show. Right. So that's kind of the driving factor for me. I mean, I could guess at the overarching stuff, but I think it's it's really just the clients changing. Right. Yeah. I guess I should also say on the on the personal side. Once this started going, I didn't do a ton to go and try recapturing business. I mean, I did put myself out there a little bit and I did have a number of client calls where things just didn't line up and never really got any feedback. You know, is it price or is it you decided you didn't need an editor? I never really got that, but didn't replace them with anything during the year, which is how we got here. So I think that's a nice segue into marketing. (laughs) Sure. Uh I was just going to say, I, I think when people are fearing the, you know, a recession coming, when we keep hearing the R word, when we keep hearing people are losing jobs, I mean, every time I sign on to LinkedIn, there's another layoff announcement, or my feed is just filled with more and more of my colleagues being laid off, mm-hmm. my connections being laid off. There's a lot of fear in the air. And I think oftentimes the first place people start to cut budgets is in creative marketing. And one of the things I hear, and I've heard a lot this year, over and over, when it comes to podcasting, when I've talked to prospects, when I've talked to clients, and I ask, have you considered podcasting? Well, we did in the past, but it was a lot of work and a lot of cost, and we didn't see the return on investment. We couldn't really trace how it was helping us with our business or how it was you know, helping us with conversions or getting us clients. So we stopped because it just seemed like too much work and too much time. I've heard that over and over. And so when we're in this time period where there's a lot of fear and penny pinching, people are like, okay, I don't need the podcast anymore. Let's just stop that. So in the marketing and branding world, we call that threats. Like when we look for threats, threats to our business, when we do that little SWAT chart, are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that might be the case here. And not necessarily that there was something wrong with your service or they weren't happy with your service. It does seem like a pattern across the board right now. So you said that you work a full-time job and you're traveling Mm -hmm. a lot. A little more travel this year. Yeah. How many hours a week would you say you have to devote to your podcast business? In the past, I've been doing about 10 hours a week. It's significantly less right now because I don't have the work to fill the time. But yeah, 10, sometimes up to 15. That Once I got to 15, it's where things kind of got a little shaky. And so that's when mm-hmm. I started bringing in contractors because it, it got to be a little bit much. And then I discovered that I only get like a 50% return on having the contractor because I still have to go back and review stuff. And there's an administrative overhead on that. But I got back some time. So you feel like 10 to 15 hours a week is about your limit. If you were to get the clients back that's a, the most you could spend right now while working full-time? I think that's, I mean, I don't know that I would ever say the most, 
right? Because mm-hmm. there's probably a, a chance you could find something else here and there, but that seems to be what was sustainable and I'll call it nearly healthy. I don't know that it was truly healthy, but at least nearly healthy. Okay. So it says you you said your ultimate dream, at least by 2027, would be to have a full-fledged production business. Mm-hmm. Now, is is your goal to eventually have your own business full-time and that be your main focus? Yeah. I find that as the business grows, it becomes harder to maintain f- focus between the job and the business. And so mm-hmm. like when it's small, it's easier. When it gets bigger, it's harder. So there's eventually you can't, you can't have two full-time things, right? Or at least yeah. I can't, maybe other people can. What does the production business look like? Does it have employees? Is it almost like an agency or is it just you and some contractors still? So, I mean, that's partly what I've been struggling with because, and maybe some of this is presumption, but it's hard for me to imagine being able to have a level of stability and provide stability for my clients without having at least contractors or some level of employees. And my experience so far has been that um, contractors are expensive and they should be, right? Because they're good at what they do, but there's a lot of, not that I've had employees, but there's some additional overhead or additional administration from having employees. So I'm not super firm on what that would need to be. I just feel like I shouldn't be the only person in the business ultimately producing because it, it all relies on me. And as much as I enjoy doing the work, I don't think that's the right thing for the clients. And I'm not sure that it's the right thing long term, because I would hate to get sick for a week and have all my clients miss their deadlines because I'm not there. Right. And conversely, I'd hate to reach out to Jesse and a couple of other editors and say, can you do all of these this week? By the way, I don't have any guidelines for you. Just figure it out. Like that's not only expensive, but it's not right for them and it's not right for the client. So like, I feel like there's got to be a sweet spot there for me somewhere. Do you always want to do production? Yeah, <laughs> that's part of the problem, yeah. right? You enjoy it? I do, yeah. There's just something about it. I mean, like anything, it, you get into it and sometimes you're not really feeling it. But yeah, I love it. I really do. So it sounds like the perfect scenario for you. You get to continue doing what you love, production, but you would have help so you're not overwhelmed and you can have ample vacation each year. Yeah, You can have that flexibility to take time off when you need it and have you know be with your family, have that work-life balance. Yeah. So I think the first question is thinking through what would it take to get there? How many clients would that be? What would that look like? What would you need to make? Right now you said, you know, your look, you want it to at least be comparable with your full-time role, right? Yeah. I mean, it it would need to be pretty close or I'd have to have some really hard conversations with my wife, right? Because we, we have kids and a house and stuff, right? So uh, yeah. I, I can't just abdicate that responsibility because I want to go chase my dreams. So yeah, it has to be close. Yeah. And without throwing out exact numbers, how, sorry, I can't word this right. <laughs> what percentage of your business income is uh, your full-time income? Doing math in my head, which is a pretty bad thing to do. I would say as of last year, it was probably 10 to 15% but the business declined through the year. And I'm also thinking profit, not gross revenue. And the year prior, it was probably closer to 20 to 25%, somewhere in that range. So think like job went up, business went down. So that widens the gap, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things that's going to take time to build. It's going to take time to get up to equal what you're currently making in your full-time income. Yeah. And I'll say like, maybe this is just me, but I can't foresee how I could truly get up to parity at a part-time level. Like there would have to be some kind of plan to close the gap or I'd have to be building out that employee base or whatever that looks like in terms of support because I can't I can't foresee something where 10 editing only clients would ever get me to anywhere near what I would need to be even if I was charging, well, maybe with super premium rates. I don't know. I mean, it depends on what you can get people to pay, but how long will they pay that, right? I mean, somebody might be willing to pay $1,000 an episode for an audio-only edit right now. Two years from now, probably not. And that that's Amanda's expert. She is the expert of all things money. So I'll let her delve into that <laughs> a little bit more. But the first part when you're thinking about brand and marketing is really clarifying those goals, figuring that part out, figuring out, okay, I have a ways to go before I can match my full-time income. I'm not going to do it all this year because that's not realistic. So how many clients do I want to have this year? How many clients do I want to have next year? What do I want to be doing? What does that look like? Do I want to be managing employees? 
Would I feel more comfortable just having contractors that help me out when I need the help? You know, thinking through all that, because managing and bringing on employees isn't for everyone. It can feel like a huge responsibility. Other people are like, yep, I want to scale up. I want to have a whole agency. I want to go. (laughs) So thinking about where do you fit there? What's going to be best for you? And then thinking about what income you ideally want to make and then planning toward that and thinking, okay, well, what marketing activities can I do that will help me reach these exact goals? Because then it'll help you measure what your marketing efforts are doing for you. So in terms of, let's say, and I'm just going to throw this out. Let's say your goal this year was to get 20 clients. And right now you have zero clients. So where do you start? The first thing you'd want to really look at is, okay, is my messaging working for me? Do I really understand my target audience? Do I know where to find them? So I'll ask that of you. Do you have a certain niche? Do you have a certain type of client that you've worked with that you loved working with and you want a hundred more of them? Yeah. So that's kind of where I've been stuck. I've really enjoyed working with the indie podcasters. I'll call it the one person show or a couple person show, right? So you get to work with the showrunner. You don't work with a committee. I really prefer that. However, my experience has been most of them don't have the budget to support the kind of editing that they actually want. So that's always been the gap. So I have worked with a large company. We'll see if that continues. I don't know. Uh, Their show is on hiatus. So we'll, we'll see if that ever comes back. I enjoyed that because I was still working with the showrunner, even though it was a larger company. But then you've got the issue of payment terms, right? You, d- you never get prepayment from a large company. You get net 30 if you're lucky, right? And so there's some, some stuff I'm trying to work through. But I would say I like working with the showrunner. I don't necessarily have a specific niche. I would prefer people with a larger budget, business owners, that kind of thing. But not necessarily, not necessarily tied to like the coaching community or the whatever. Like, I don't really have a preference there. I just want to pe- work with people that are passionate about what they do and can pay. <laughs> That's the tricky part. <laughs> Are yeah. there any topics that have really fascinated you? So, I mean, w- one of the shows that I worked on was Focus Rights show uh, where they interview audio engineers because I love audio. That's super interesting to me. I was also really surprised that they would have outsourced their production because it's a whole company <laughs> of audio people, but they did. And I'm good with that. The other one that really surprised me was I have one client right now that basically just interviews people about things, uh, doctors, whatever. It's just who she met and what, what they can. And surprisingly, like she's probably 15 years older than I am, something like that. But the topics that she's choosing, even though it's not what I would normally listen to, I get done editing every episode. I'm like, I'm I'm smarter because of what she did. So like, it's just things I can learn about, I guess. I wish I was more specific. I really do. You just want to learn new things. What do do you really love about working with the indie showrunners specifically? Yeah. I mean, they care about what they're doing. They enjoy what they're doing. If they didn't, they'd just stop. I mean, for lack of a better, they bring it or they don't. And they, the ones that I've worked with, they generally do. They care about growing their show. They, most of, most of the ones that I work with care about the audio quality, care about the show quality. Some of them, I haven't ended up with anybody that wishes they could just hold my hand while I do the editing for them. Like, can you, like, they're not super control freaks. I don't have any of this whole, we have to deal with legal or any of that stuff. It's just nice to work with the showrunner. I I think that's a lot of it right there. Yeah. What I'm hearing is you love working with like passionate thought leaders and mentors Mm -hmm. who love what they do, who love to teach and educate others and really want to keep growing and really care about the quality of their podcast and the quality of what they put out there. Like you said, they really care about what they do. So Mm -hmm. I think when you're thinking about your messaging, when you're thinking about your marketing, starting there, what would they really resonate with? Because you really resonate with them. What kind of messaging would draw them in talking about those things, talking about, I work with podcasters who really care about what they do. I work with mentors. I am a, you know, insatiable learner myself. And, you know, I love working with people who are passionate about these topics and passionate about educating their community. I'm just spitballing right now. But these are this is where you can start really connecting with the people you want to be working with in terms of your external presence, right? The other piece of it is doing that market research. 
it helps to know who you want to work with, who you like working with. So you mentioned the indie showrunner, but thinking about, okay, which one of them has the budget? Where are the ones who have the budget to pay for my quality of work? Where do they exist? Where do they live? Where can I find them? So thinking through that piece of it, where do these showrunners hang out online? Do you know? No, because if I did, I would totally be there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, where did you find them? One of them was a referral from, um, well, same person. So Jesse went through the podcast engineering school. That's how I found the Focus Right show was through that. It was a referral through that. One of them was just a random post in a podcasting group where somebody said, I'm looking for an editor. And somebody, I think it might have been Steve Stewart, tagged me and said, hey, he lives in Nashville. You should talk to him because I think it was the Nashville group. It was was that kind of thing. Almost all of the people I've found have either been referrals or somebody that I've interacted with online, generally in one of the Facebook groups for podcasting, because I love those people, even though, you know, there's a, a zillion editors in there. Every once in a while, I find one and they actually want to work with me. I I don't know why. I mean, you mentioned passion for audio. So maybe you can start there because it's easiest when you can at least think of, hey, I'd really like to do more shows about audio or I'd really like to do more shows about, I'm just throwing this out here, like marketing or music. If you have topics you already know you like in Mm. industries that you feel drawn to for one reason or another, it helps when you're doing that research to be able to start with something because it's easier than to pinpoint where those people might hang out and join those groups and join those communities. I find people have a lot of luck joining groups and just participating, engaging, not selling anything, just being part of those groups on, you know, community. There's discord groups, for instance, there's Facebook groups, there is Reddit. Like you can find just about any topic you would ever want to know about, join. It doesn't matter what it is, type it in, you will find it. (laughs) You will find a whole group thread about it. Um, But it it really is. It's a good place to start and really think of, to start your research and gather that information and meet people and talk to people. The other thing that really helps is if you have, you know, communicate, you're still communicating with former clients or current clients, or you have good relationships with people who, Hey, if they ran a podcast, you'd love to work with them, being able to talk to them, just say, Hey, would you have a coffee with me in person, virtual, depending on the situation and just ask them about their day, ask them about their challenges, ask them like, if they were to run a podcast, what would they be concerned about? What would they want to do? It's just being curious, learning about them So you have a better idea, again, of how to talk to them, how to communicate with them. So for instance, if you're setting up like a funnel on your website, you know what offers to make them that are really going to entice the types of people you want to work with. So a lot of marketing isn't necessarily just writing a bunch of blogs and posting a bunch of social media. It's really connecting with and getting to know the people you want to work with and talk to. So those are two things that I might start with. Just figure out and get a clearer picture of what you want to do, where you want to go and who you want to be working with. And I know that's hard when you're just a curious person and you want to learn everything because I'm the same way. So many people have asked me, you know, Tara, you need a niche down with marketing and I'm a marketer. (laughs) And I'm like, I, I, Amanda's laughing because she knows. (laughs) I'm like, I, I love working with nonprofits. I love working with creatives. I love working with so many different types of people and in industries, and I've, I've enjoyed doing that. And when somebody asks me, niche down, that's a little stressful because I'm like, I don't know. But I found it's much easier to just pinpoint one industry and start there and see how I like it. And if I feel like, you know what, I want to work with other types of people, I can. I can branch out from there because it's so much easier to start smaller and market there and grow than it is to try and just say, oh, I'll work with anybody. You know, I just love people. I love connecting with people. You can say that, but it's a little bit harder to target your messaging and your emails if you want to do that. And the last thing I'll talk about, because I feel like I'm taking up too much time on marketing, but um, is really thinking through your prospect journey, so to speak, and 
what you're willing to do marketing wise. What are your passions? Because it's not helpful to do the things you don't love doing when it comes to marketing. Because if somebody says, well, you, you need to write five blogs a month, Brian, how do you feel about that? Does that make you excited? No. (laughs) Makes me the opposite of excited. Exactly. What about if I said you have to produce one podcast episode a month talking about what you love and what's on your mind? That sounds a little more interesting. It sounds a little more interesting. So it's about figuring that out too. Yeah. You know, what are the things that you love doing that you can put out there that are helping people informing people, educating people. I think the show is a really good part of that because people get to know you, they get to know your personality and that goes a long way. Yeah. I love doing this show. I I honestly do. I mean, we struggle a little bit internally because we're always thinking like, this doesn't really point anybody else back to our businesses, right? Because our audience is editors and producers. (laughs) (laughs) So we're, we're basically upskilling our competition, but we love them. So like, how do we not do that? Right. But that's a wonderful thing. You're helping people and you're actually growing your pe- people's trust in you and your brand because they see that you're doing that and you're not doing it to sell anything. You're just doing it because you love doing it. And it comes across as authentic and real. And I would want to work with you. Sorry, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. I'm used to it. <laughs> Well, I'd say the same thing about Jesse. You both have that. You're both authentic. You both love educating and just helping people for the sake of helping people. And who doesn't want to work with people like that? You know, I mean, that is all part of branding and marketing. It's you're already doing it. It's more just thinking about, okay, what avenues are going to work best for me? Thank you. And that kind of ties in too, though. Like you said, you're building this community. Say you and Jesse have a lot of things in common as you do build your business and you get to that point where you need to have somebody else because you can't be the only person doing the work all the time, you need to go on that trip. You had mentioned that you, you know, sometimes have to hire a contractor, but then you, you can't even really give them the instruction and all of that. So if you have somebody like, I'm just going to keep using Jesse because his face is right there and he's a person to use for that. But if you and Jesse could probably come to some kind of agreement that would work, that if you work in similar ways, you care about people in the same way, because it's really hard to find somebody that you trust that can do your work. Like you said, you even go back and you kind of have to check the contractor's work because it's, they're your clients and you have a certain level of quality that you want to deliver It's really, really hard to get to that point where you trust somebody else to do that same level of quality so you don't have to go check their work. And I I say that from from my, it took me years and years and years to find somebody in, in my production work, which is more in TV and film, but finding somebody who I could actually just say, okay, you go handle this. I'm not going to worry about it. You're going to take care of it. You're going to do it in a way that I'm comfortable with. I don't have to second guess what you're doing. We're okay here. But having somebody like that eventually, and I think a community like this, you're building that that networking thing, not just in terms of clients, because once you get a client, word of mouth goes probably further than anything as far, you know, you find somebody like, oh, well, this guy does really good work for me. Oh, and you, they, then they hear somebody who might be looking for an editor and they'll refer you. But also on the internal business side, if you have someone else that can help you with maybe the things that you don't like, like you said, maybe, maybe Jesse loves blogs. I, I don't think that's the case, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe in this community, you, you find someone and you're able to kind of work things out in a way where you're supporting each other. Even if you're not in the same business necessarily, you're not business partners, but you can still partner with other maybe small business owners, individuals that can build things going forward. And that, that helps too, because then you're still doing your own business, but you don't feel so alone in that business. It's important to start to realize that the reality of making a living off of podcasters is going to be difficult. Ideally, we're looking for people who happen to podcast, but are other things. Businesses, coaches, people who have a monetary gain from the podcast. They're going to value what we do better than podcasters who are struggling to even pay for whatever they're doing for the show. So like Tara was saying, trying to figure out who you can work with. If you 
try to market yourself to podcasters. What happens when you see somebody post in a Facebook group saying, I'm looking for a podcast editor? All the editors come out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You see a hundred responses within an hour. Mm -hmm. But if you go to, let's use Tara's example of marketing, you want to work with marketers. If you go into a marketing group, you might be the only podcast editor there. So when people have questions about podcasting, they're going to go to you. So all of a sudden, you're the big fish in a small pond, as opposed to a fish that you can't even see in the <laughs> pond because there's so many of them. So that's one of the biggest things I've found is my best clients aren't podcasters. They use podcasting as part of their business, whether it's brand awareness, lead generation, personal branding, whatever the case is. So that's another thing that kind of ties in with what Tara was saying. If we try to target everybody, we can't really target anybody. And that's yeah. a wrap. <laughs> I was going to ask, and what is your reaction to that, Brian? I can tell from your expression. You're like, no, I mean, that's, that's not new news, right? It's just a real challenge to find that right group of people. I'm obviously not opposed to working with business owners, I do have a little bit of head junk to work through in terms of the coaching space because almost everything I've seen in that space is quantity, quantity, quantity. Who cares about quality? It, it's, it's your MVP. It doesn't have to be good. And that tends to overflow. And so my experience has been it's really hard to find somebody who cares as much about quality as they're going to expect you to care about the quality of their show, if that makes sense. I don't like being in the position where I care more about the client's show than they do. That to me is very uncomfortable. So I want to know that they do more. And most of what I've seen isn't that. That doesn't mean it's not out there. Maybe I'm just hanging out with the wrong groups. Well, and that's where really qualifying your client, your prospects really comes in. The more you can narrow that down, you can focus your copy. You can make it clear to them if you're the type that doesn't care about anything, you're looking for an MVP product, I'm not the person for you. You can make it clear like you were saying earlier, I want to work with the people who take pride in their show, they want the best, and they're willing to pay for that. You use your website to communicate that, and that helps kind of weed out those tire kickers or the people that just want fast turnaround, large quantities, regardless of how it sounds. I'm taking notes. As you should. <laughs> What podcast do you really love listening to? What are your top three that you don't miss? Um, so currently, and it's not because of the quality of the show, but currently the podcasting 2.0 show, I catch that one pretty religiously, Pod News Daily, and then there's a couple others that are kind of focused in that same vein. But right now, because I don't have a commute and because I've been fairly busy, my listening is way down from what it used to be. So there are other shows that used to be in that queue that were more for enjoyment rather than just staying up to date that have kind of fallen by the wayside. So I don't really have one where I'd go like, that's my pleasure. Listen. Well, what was your pleasure? Listen, I'm trying to think, cause it's been a bit, there, there were some that were kind of funny that I enjoyed. I'm not really thinking about those. I think probably from a quality standpoint and learning stuff, I really enjoyed 20,000 Hertz, which is like super off the chain from a quality standpoint. Most of the other scripted shows really kind of, I don't enjoy them, but that was one where I was like, I really like what they've done here. Do you enjoy more talk like interview style type shows where it's like this, just talking back and forth? It's nothing that's scripted. I tend to. Yeah. If I'm going to do something scripted, it's probably going to be streaming video or something like that for podcasting. For me, I tend to like it being that more raw experience, not no shade on the audio dramas or anything. It's just, if I'm going to do a drama, it's going to be something where I'm going to sit down and watch it. So that it's actually taking my attention if I'm listening to a podcast, it's because I'm driving or doing something else. Mm -hmm. Are those the kinds of podcasts that you prefer producing? The interviews? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Interviews, monologues, panel discussions. I love those. I've not really done much in the... Actually, I don't know that I've done anything in the scripted space yet. Not that I'm opposed to it, but that's not really what my skill set is. At least from my perspective, I've gotten really good at the, the audio repair, the mix and master, and the straight through linear edit. I don't tend to do story edits. It's just not a skill set that I've really spent much time with. And honestly, I've never had a client with a budget that could support me going through and mapping out their show and then figuring out what to cut because 
that's going to be multiples of what I currently charge. I don't know how many, but it's not going to be just one multiple. <laughs> Understandable. So I haven't heard of 20,000 Hertz. What is it about? It's about sound. <laughs> I, I know it sounds ridiculous. It's, a, it's put out by a sound design company, and they tend to go through weird things about sound. The one that I remember was the people that do voiceovers for subways. I really enjoyed that one. It's kind of a ridiculous topic, but it was really well done, and I enjoyed it. I don't enjoy the ads. I realize I got to pay for the show, but man, three minute breaks for paid ads. I'll skip that every day. So it sounds like you are just about as obsessed with sound as Jesse. And I don't think I've (laughs) met anyone as obsessed with sound as Jesse. Like he will hear things in music and in TV shows and just about anything. He'll, he'll tell me the frequencies in my voice, like where my voice falls to a point where I'm like, I don't hear that. What are you talking about? He's like, You can't hear that. No, I can't hear that. Yeah, I have issues. (laughs) They're they're similar to Jesse's probably. My wife still doesn't know what I mean when I say, yeah, I can hear the tube saturation in that one, but that's okay. She doesn't have to. (laughs) I mean, yeah, you both have that similarity where it's really important. That sound experience is really important to what you do every day. You put a lot of effort and love into that. So I think, again... I'm really bringing that out. And again, I haven't, I know I went to your website a long time ago. I haven't been to it recently. Talking about that more specifically, like let that love of sound and the experience that you want to give others, the audio experience, let that shine through and talk about it. Share your thoughts on it. Share the why. Get people to care about it. Tell your story about it. Because I think, you know, granted, if we're using a bunch of technical terms and We're talking about, I'm not even going to try to use sound design terms, but if we're throwing a bunch of that out, yeah, you might attract audiophiles, you might attract people like you, but if you can find a way to talk about what you do in a way that I could understand it and relate to it, or Amanda, and put that out there, I think, again, that's that can really help. You know, just thinking through really unique ways you can communicate and do what you love and put that out there in a way that's not forced. You're not writing those blogs every month to talk about this or that. Another way it's helpful to know who you want to work with is you can actually talk about those topics that they care about. So using the example of marketers again, marketers, they care about conversion rates and open <laughs> rates on email and what what the latest thing with Google is and you know basically the latest compliance we have to go after and, and we have to add these records to our you know, oh, the email up. thing? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it is. Like, life and marketing is just filled with updates and keeping up with technology and keeping up with what Google is doing and what the latest, you know, best practices are for our website and how we send emails and how we keep data. It goes on and on. And most marketers are just running around going... I don't have time for this. And now they want me to start a podcast. Are you kidding me? I don't have time. Help me. So, you know, if you were interested, for example, in working with marketers, you might start thinking through, okay, how can I help these poor people? (laughs) How can I make their day a little bit easier talking about some of these topics? So again, like when you're thinking about who you want to work with, or if there are some industries that you feel like you can contribute to meaningfully, That's, again, a really good place to start. And we don't have to get it right the first time. This is all an ongoing iterative iterative process. What matters is starting somewhere, seeing what works, and adapt as we go. I have a question for you. And it's my stuff is always the boring stuff, right? It's like the businessy stuff. It's (laughs) it's what nobody ever wants to talk about. But so you had said that you can allocate maybe 10 hours a week to your business, but you haven't as Mm -hmm. much because you've lost these clients. Are you still spending 10 hours on your business? Like the time that you used to spend on client work, are you using that for your marketing, for your other things? Like time management becomes a really unpopular thing, but a very necessary thing, especially I think one of the hardest things to do is to manage a full-time job and then try to build a business in your off time. While you said you also have a wife and kids 
And that's a whole lot of stuff. And you are one person and, you know, same amount of hours in the day. So it, sometimes it becomes almost like giving yourself a schedule. Like you might only have a few hours of editing to do, but you know, like, are you filling that extra five hours then with doing things that can help you get to where you want to be on the, these next steps? Or is it more like, well, I don't have the work right now, so I'm going to go do this other thing. Are you thinking about it pretty actively or? I've been kind of directionless, Mm -hmm. which is part of what led to the conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago. So the answer is no, but it's not because I haven't wanted to. It's because I haven't really had anything to put my focus against. And so I took the position, I'm not going to sit there and flounder right now. I'm going to wait until I've got a little bit of direction before I start doing something. And maybe that's an excuse. I'll potentially own that as an excuse, but it's what I've been doing. So I've been sleeping um, in the mornings <laughs> instead of producing podcasts before I go to work, which has been nice, but I'm, I'm ready to start doing some stuff. I think it's still finding that balance. Sleep is very important. You're going to do better work when you, you're well rested. You're going to feel better. And I think it's, it's the hard thing, right? Everybody's trying to find this work-life balance you just happen to have two works. You have your full-time work and you have the work that you're passionate about and you want to make your full-time work, but you have to, like, if, if you were to not have your full-time job, suddenly you have, what, 40, 50 extra hours in the week, whether you commute or not. Like, there's a lot of time that is spent that you could then invest into marketing and all of these other things, but then you don't have the income to make you comfortable. It's that, you know, it's, and everybody has their different threshold of when it's time to make that leap of, okay, I'm getting close. And I know that if I had more time, then I could get to that next step in my journey. But that next step requires letting go of the comfort and the security. And that's not what I'm telling you to do by any means. I'm not advising ever anybody to take that leap before they're ready because it, you know, it can be scary. It can be very exciting and and fulfilling and all of that, but it's, do you have a lot of the things like, is it all in your head mostly? Do you think about it a lot, but there's not really, like, I know you're taking notes now, but do you have any, anything kind of written down just to get it out of your head of these are the things I want to do. These are things I need to do. So you can kind of get them organized in a way. Sometimes if you're a visual person, just even seeing a bunch of things on a, maybe not pen and paper, but sometimes that works or whatever app you like to write or draw things in, but just to kind of get it all out of your head. Because I think a lot of times people, creatives especially, but, you know, a lot of people, we just, we think a lot and it it seems like, oh, well, no, I I know all the things that I need to know. It's all in my head. But once you actually start writing it down or typing it out or however it is, then suddenly you realize like, huh, okay, yeah, I I, I have some things to work with here. And if I start it at this point and then, okay, now I have, I can start building a strategy or if you don't like the word strategy, just a, you know, a step-by-step, a to-do, a fancy to-do list, if you will. Because sometimes words like strategy will throw somebody off like, no, I, I don't, I don't want to be strategic. I want to be creative. <laughs> but that's the, the other part about the running the business is you get to do all the creative things, but unfortunately it does require a lot of the, this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say currently, no, not a lot written down. All the, all the existing production processes, those are all written down. I can do those from memory, but yeah, those are all written down, of course. Uh, the marketing and some of this stuff, no, no, it's not. Don't have a good reason why, except I've not done it, I guess. I think you're good at, you have the production processes down because that's what you like to do. And that's, uh-huh. I mean, the stuff that you don't want to do, you're never going to intentionally put your focus on that because it's not fun. It's like, yeah, I always use bookkeeping as a thing. Nobody wants to do bookkeeping. Nobody is like thinking, I can't wait to get home tonight and go dig into my accounts receivables. It's just not really, well, there are probably people out there who do like that. I shouldn't say nobody, but in the creative world, I have uh, not met many of them. It's usually the first thing that people outsource. But it's something to think about too. And I forget, you'd mentioned, say like, again, we're back to blogs and Jesse's for whatever reason, not going to write your blogs. And that's what you think that you need to do. There is that again, it's it's the value of time and kind of considering it. It's you can do it yourself, but if it it takes all the joy out of your world to think, I have to sit here and I have to write this thing. How much time are you spending on it versus if you hired somebody who loves to write blogs 
or if it's bookkeeping, how much, you know, you might spend three, four hours doing this stuff that you don't enjoy doing. It's not making you happy at all. You could pay somebody else. And yes, that's an expense, but that person who loves doing books might be able to do that three or four hours of your work in one hour. And so it's, it's just, but it frees up four hours of your time to then dedicate to something that will make you happier or maybe bring more value back to you. Like maybe it's, maybe, and maybe it is, it's finding these groups that you want to hang out in. And then you spend that extra three or four hours interacting with the people you want to be talking to. And then that could lead to some work. So I'm always a big fan of keep your expenses low, but if you're spending a lot of time doing something that you hate or are not good at, like those are the two things that you outsource. If you don't like doing it or you're not good at it, or maybe not good at, um, you're just maybe less efficient than others at. We'll, we'll put it that way. But th- sometimes that's a way, especially when you have such limited time, to be able to, you are spending a little bit, but it's kind of an investment that you can hopefully then, because you know if you take that three hours and then you get a new client, now it just, it paid for that, you know, blog writer, bookkeeper person <laughs> or people. And they're all finished. Thank you. I've got one little thing and then I know we've got to wrap it up. But essentially to get where you're going, you need to get started. Every journey is one step at a time. If we don't take that first step, we're never going to get anywhere. We can't let the analysis paralysis get in our way. Thank you. Thank you all. With that, we do need to go ahead and wrap it up because we committed to an hour and we like to be people of our word. But also, I have a suspicion that some of the people either watching live or catching the the replay or the podcast later might like what they hear and might want to take a similar step for themselves. You guys did this for us for free, which was very generous and very kind. But if somebody wants to be part of the community, who should I ask about how they can do that? Tara, you're kind of handling what we're working on right now. Yeah, so... I would love to talk to people and help them out. You can reach me at tansyaster.com and schedule a call with me. (laughs) And we're actually working on packages aimed at creatives to help them solve the problems they're having like this. Which I guess made this the perfect time for us to all get together and talk about this and the right time for me to have problems. (laughs) So everybody, you're welcome. (laughs) With that, we're going to go ahead and say goodbye. If you joined us live, we're super glad that you were here. If you caught the replay or the podcast later, glad that you could do that. So I'm Brian. I'm at toptieraudio.com. And uh, then on this side is... Jennifer Longworth, bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. Amanda, and you can find me at aardvarkgirl.com. That's two A's in aardvark. (laughs) Jesse, you can find me at Tansy Aster Audio or Tansy Aster Academy. Tara, you can find me at tansyaster.com. And unable to join us tonight were Daniel Abendroth at rothmedia.audio and Carrie, who you can find at, at carrie.land. Carrie. Land. I should remember that because it's so much fun to say, but carrie.land. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you next week. And now I've got to click a button, so we'll see if I can do that. Bye. 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 Uh, so um, how much is that? <gasps> Um, 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 um